Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs to our ongoing webinar series on U.S. global engagement. Uh, I'm very happy today to have uh, with us not only my co-host for the Doorstep podcast, Tatiana Serafin, uh, but to welcome Ash Jane of the Atlantic Council. Uh, Ash is a uh, well known to us uh, in the global engagement uh, community and uh, in this project and has uh, spoken several times at the council before, uh, both uh, in the chat and then in the transcript, uh, we'll be connecting to his full and distinguished biography. Uh, but he has been overseeing uh, a very interesting project uh, at the Atlantic Council, uh, which is looking at reconnecting and reinvigorating the community of democratic states uh, to be able to work together uh, to share and pool their efforts uh, in an increasingly unstable and competitive world where authoritarian powers seek to revise uh, the international system uh, and how do we meet this challenge and how do we not only meet this challenge but how do we through cooperation of the major democratic states uh, work to improve outcomes for for our citizens so he'll be joining us uh, today to discuss uh, the democratic community, where we are at this uh, stage of this project, uh, and prospects for this perhaps serving as a template and model uh, for U.S. global engagement going forward. So before I turn over the floor to Ash, uh, I'd again like to, to recognize my, my co-host and, and panelists, uh, co-panelists today, uh, Tatsana Serafin, and if you have anything to also uh, start us off with, uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's such an important discussion uh, to begin looking at what the next perhaps four years might look like. Here we are in the middle of a highly politicized election and the two different candidates have very different views of the international order. Uh, and I think this has to play into how we are looking at your work and your project and prospects um, and how this will impact our American citizens um, at, in their wallet and in their everyday lives. So we'll turn the floor over to you, Ash, if you could perhaps again, for some of our viewers and, and people who are taking part in this webinar, uh, who have seen you and engaged with you at the council already, they may be familiar with uh, the project. We have others who are joining uh, us essentially for the first time. So perhaps give us an overview of the project, what it is seeking to accomplish, uh, and any of the important takeaways uh, from the meetings that you've been having uh, especially within the last several months and during the, the conditions that we've seen uh, result uh, as, a, as a consequence of the pandemic. Terrific. Well, uh, Nick, thank you for having me. Uh, Tatiana, it's great to be with you. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you all today about this project and our efforts uh, on the Democratic Order Initiative, uh, which I would love to give you a brief uh, overview uh, for those of you not familiar with it. Um, and then get into some of the both uh, specifics regarding why this project is important, what we're trying to achieve, and how do we move forward at a time when there is renewed interest in how to rebuild American alliances and democratic partnerships uh, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into. Um, so let me start by saying uh, the, the project that I'm leading at the Atlantic Council is called the Democratic Order Initiative. And as the name uh, suggests, the, the purpose of the project is to strengthen engagement with democratic allies and partners to build a rules-based order, an international system that is based on common values and a commitment to certain principles, uh, democratic norms, uh, an open global economy, uh, a kind of uh, rules based or, or a set of rules for how the, the United States and its allies <clears throat> should engage uh, in the world. And that, that system, the system that, have, that we have known for so many decades is facing tremendous challenge. Uh, it had been even before 2016 uh, due, to, due to in part to the challenges from Russia and China and, and autocratic powers that don't see the world the same way. And since 2016, we're now seeing that kind of uh, uh, support for American engagement in the world being uh, met with a lot of skepticism. So the project that we're engaged in is focused on rebuilding support here at home for American leadership in the world, 
around these principles and, and, and around this kind of engagement. But equally important is to connect in new ways with allies and partners so that we build the infrastructure uh, for democratic engagement. Um, so let me start by asking the question, why? Why is it so important that we engage uh, or strengthen cooperation uh, with, with uh, like-minded allies uh, and democracies? Well, there are two reasons that I think are important to consider. The, the first is we're entering this era of great power competition that you see a lot of, the term is thrown about uh, in, in uh, policy circles. But what it means is that we're facing a time uh, where we're seeing pushback from autocratic powers, leading powers like Russia and China who have a lot of influence uh, in the world. China, in the case of China, influence that's growing as their economy grows and as they wield greater uh, influence in uh, international institutions. And Russia, which even though it's uh, a much smaller power as measured by GDP, still has considerable resources to influence outcomes and shape the way in which uh, nations engage, particularly in Europe and elsewhere around the world through uh, asymmetric measures uh, and, and various other ways as we're seeing with election meddling even as we speak uh, here in the United States. So we're facing a, a time in which we're seeing a lot of pushback for what we believe in as democracies or for how we want to see the world engage uh, and that means that we need to work in a way that's bringing together a coalition of allies and partners to address, uh, to address, the, to address those challenges. Um, and therefore, in an era of great power competition, you know, the United States can't go it alone. We have to go, we're much in a much stronger position if we have partners that, that see the world in similar ways uh, and that are prepared to act with us to, to leverage uh, our own influence. Um, and then the second reason why it's important to engage is not just because there are threats that we need to deal with, but because it's in our interest to find other nations, to work with other nations, to solve some of the challenges that we're trying to face, which we know in a globalized world we can't do by ourselves, whether it's the pandemic and the scourge of the coronavirus that we're all suffering through today, uh, whether it's terrorism uh, as we've seen over the years, um, nuclear proliferation, climate change, uh, building an open global economy. Those are, those are important ways that affect Americans in their everyday lives in which we cannot succeed if we're not working more closely with allies uh, and we don't have a grouping of uh, partners who can help us achieve the goals that we're seeking. Uh, we're not a, we may be a superpower, but we're not omnipotent and we can't we can't succeed if we're by ourselves. Uh, America alone won't work. So, um, so therefore, I think it's, the, the, it's important to have structures. It's important to have this mindset that we, that we want to work with allies and partners. Um, and then that brings me to the, the, the notion of, of how and, and where do we go? How, how do we build the, the kind of system uh, to, to bring that power and influence of our allies together in an, in an organized way. Um, it, it really starts with a mindset, first and foremost, that, that it is important to work with these kinds of partners, whether it's across the Atlantic or across the Pacific, uh, North America, the, the, the democratic community can be small or large, but the mindset of we, wanna, we want to cultivate relationships and build support with those partners, uh, that's, that's the starting point. We can do that by either using existing platforms, uh, international structures or entities that exist already, uh, or building new ones. And, and I think some combination is what we think, what we believe will be uh, most effective um, in addressing these challenges. Um, let me just move around because of the, the sunlight here. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, so the, the entities that we have put on the table for, for success that we think will be useful as we look down the road, uh, starts with something called the D10. Um, we have the G7 uh, Leaders Summit, which actually President Trump has postponed. The US is actually the president of the G7 this year, but the, but the G7 has been meeting for several years uh, since the 1970s. It brings together the leading democracies in Europe, 
uh, as well as Canada and Japan, uh, and has been a platform for talking about common concerns. Russia was in the G7 for a little while. Of course, it was evicted when uh, they invaded Crimea. Trump has talk talked about bringing the Russians back and having Putin re-engage, which I think would be a, a fundamental mistake uh, because the G7 represents the beginnings of what could be the foundation of a democratic community. It's already there, it has a, it has a tradition of, of regular meetings. What we've proposed is to take the G7 and elevate it to a D10, meaning bringing in more allies from Asia, uh, Japan, or I'm sorry, South Korea and Australia to join Japan, uh, possibly India, um, and then maybe others from other parts of the world, but starting with a baseline of countries that have influence and that have a common worldview, uh, because that's what you need to begin to engender the kind of cooperation around these challenges whether it's dealing with Russia and China or whether it's dealing with the, the range of other issues we talked about. So the D10 is one concept that has taken, that is getting a lot of interest and traction. Uh, the British will be the G7 presidency, uh, will be taking the G7 presidency next year. Um, and there have already been reports uh, of the British uh, talking about having a D10 technology coalition in place, for instance, to begin to support cooperation on technology norms. Um, and, and that brings me to a couple of other areas where coalitions of democracies could make a real difference, uh, including on technology. We are in a, in a phase where in, we're in a place where a lot of advanced technologies are making their way online and uh, coming to fruition, whether it's artificial intelligence, uh, whether it's robotics, uh, whether it's um, genetic engineering. And we're in a bit of a competition right now to see who, which countries will be able to develop those technologies first. Um, and there is a lot of concern that if the Chinese are at the table first with, with bringing these to, to, uh, to, to life, they may not reflect the kind of standards, norms, and values uh, that, that we would want to see attached to them. So it's in our interest both to, to use our capabilities to get these, to harness these technologies, but then also make sure that they're, uh, they're, they, they reflect common norms. Um, so a technology alliance of democracies, maybe it's the D10 plus others who are strong on technology uh, would be a good way to organize uh, around that. Uh, another area is on uh, uh, pandemic uh, and health security. And um, it's a missed opportunity. Trump has, the Trump administration has largely uh, avoided a kind of coordination structure with allies. There is a, there, there have been occasional G7 phone calls, uh, but what's missing is a concerted effort, a focused kind of task force of the G7 that can bring uh, to the table coordination on a vaccine, coordination on other uh, issues relating to stimulating the, the economy. It's not just democracies that need to do that. Uh, G7 is one place to have that conversation, uh, but, but the G20 as well. Um, we also have, uh, have talked about promoting and advancing an open global trading uh, system that, that builds connections and that allows for, uh, for economies to engage with each other but also in ways that protect workers uh, and that are, are uh, recognizing that there are impacts uh, to ordinary people that uh, have to be reflected in, in a way of engaging in the world. And so I think a, a trade uh, alliance of democracies focused on opening up and, and reducing trade barriers, uh, but doing it in, in new ways uh, that, that are innovative um, and that are reflective of the concerns that we know are real to people today is going to be important. And we've, we've uh, encouraged the idea of linking a transatlantic trade agreement with a trans-Pacific trade agreement, a kind of free world knitting together of markets uh, that would benefit all of us uh, rather than trying to regionalize it um, as, we, uh, as we've seen and, and hasn't worked uh, in, in, in the past years. Um, and then finally, we have also put on the table this idea of an alliance of free nations, an alliance of democracies that would be a gathering for countries that share common values beyond just the D10 or a small group of, of partners, but rather a larger coalition from you know, Asia, Africa, Latin America, all across the world um, who 
who can galvanize and pull in the same direction when it comes to some of these common challenges. It's kind of a compliment to the UN. Um, and this idea of an alliance of democracies is still at a nascent stage. Uh, it's going to take a lot of, uh, a lot of um, discussion to figure out what it looks like and how you get it off the ground. Uh, I do think it's interesting that the concept of democracies working together has gained a lot of traction. Uh, uh, Joe Biden, uh, Vice President Biden has talked about a summit of democracy, um, which would be a step in the direction of working more closely with allies, or, I'm sorry, with, with democratic uh, partners around the world. Um, so there is, I think, room to consider and to think about what, what a structure would look like. Um, we have the community of democracies already in existence, which is a not very well known platform for talking about democracy promotion. Um, it's not very active. It's not um, it, it beyond, beyond a small kind of niche area of, of promoting democratic norms. And it also includes a number of non-democracies. So I'm not sure that's the best pathway to get there, but we can talk uh, more about the way forward um, in the discussion. Uh, so in, in sum, I think this is an, a, a time where we're seeing a renewed interest in working more closely with countries that share common values and countries that have a common interest in expanding cooperation. And that's really what we're aiming for, uh, pushing forward on different platforms, different mechanisms and different topics on which we can see greater coordination uh, when it comes to uh, strengthening the democratic community. That is such um, a great project. And um, thank you so much for um, summing it up, um, and there's so many different tacks we could take. But the first one I wanna take is something you mentioned in the beginning, is the effect of the pandemic on your work. Um, to a certain extent, you know, now you have a lot of countries looking more internally um, at the extreme economic downfalls. Um, we are in a, a huge recession that is really impacting the lower 25% of our population. You know, there's been a bounce on the upper 20, 25%. Our income inequality disparities are growing tremendously. Um, and there's been this internal focus even more so uh, than under the current administration. So how do we, and what are some of your recommendations to kind of expand our view outward again when it's sort of become very inward looking? Yeah, I mean, I think it's natural that you start to turn inward, uh, especially when you're um, facing so many crises at the same time. I mean, the, the, the pandemic in particular has uh, upended the way we live. Uh, we're just struggling to find, you know, how do we get our kids educated and how do we go to work and, uh, you know, how do we get access to, um, you know, groceries. I mean, it's just from, from the gamut. And so naturally uh, thinking about how a broader kind of set of issues on engaging in the world isn't going to be top of mind for most people. Um, but I would say that it is important that there, there, are, uh, there are people thinking about how, that, how those, the connection with the world affects ordinary, the ordinary lives of people. Um, because the, the pandemic is a great example of a kind of challenge that is global. It, it, it is something that came from overseas. It's something that affects people all around the world. It's linked us together in ways that are, uh, have been extraordinary. I mean, we're all facing the same kinds of challenges, whether you're sitting in Washington or, or, or Indiana or uh, you know, Brazil or, or, or anywhere else. And so uh, the fact that uh, this, is, this is the kind of global challenge that in order to solve it requires cooperation at a global level. Um, so, so I think that's one part of it. Um, it's also opened up some extraordinary opportunities and just the fact that we're able to link this way through Zoom as an example of ways that technology can connect us and that we should leverage and do a lot more of that um, and not let distance hinder the way in which we interact and work together. And I think the same would apply at the global uh, level where governments and officials and even citizens should be engaging and be able to feel comfortable talking and interacting a lot more with others around the world uh, because we do have a lot to draw on when it comes to seeing how others are facing these challenges as well. Um, so I, I think now is the time for 
not just doing this in, a, in an isolated way or at different uh, kinds of levels, but rather organizing structures through governments at the front end, but other supplemented by others as well, but, but having places where we can, we can regularly interact and engage uh, on, a, on a common agenda to solve some of these challenges. And, and of course, there's nothing, nothing greater a, a priority than the pandemic and the economic fallout uh, that has resulted from the pandemic. Yeah, the, Ash, if I can then take uh, from Tatiana's question and your response and, and maybe ask you to update a bit further, which is the idea, are these ideas gaining traction? Uh, you know, you've expressed kind of the, the general sentiment, the pandemic has hit, that woke people up to who you trade with, who you depend upon for pharmaceuticals and PPE, uh, which platforms you use, which technology you use uh, matters perhaps for privacy concerns or where it's being manufactured or who is doing the manufacturing. Uh, are you seeing this both at the, at the governmental level, but also uh, among the general public, or at least in, in terms of the narratives that are being said that people are, we, you know, we've seen very remarkable Pew polling that suggests that China's public image in the world has really done a 180, whereas they were seen as a very responsible uh, norm establishing power several years ago. Now there is, at least within the democracies, uh, a sense that China is, uh, is not, uh, not constructive. Uh, we've just sent out uh, and, and we've posted in the chat a link to the, you know, the, the state of the order, uh, which is part mm -hmm. of the, the democratic uh, uh, order initiative. Uh, you know, are we seeing sense that this is, this is resonating and that, you know, whether Britain will have the G7 presidency, we may have a change uh, not only in this country, certainly the executive branch could change, but also the, the balance in Congress could change uh, with, with, and potentially with some new faces coming in. Uh, are you seeing that there's a moment to move these ideas from ideas to uh, policies or you know, ideas into narratives that then political leaders were, are going to start to, to, to discuss? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first of all, thanks for posting the State of the Order in, in the chat. State, State of the Order is a new publication uh, that we started a few months ago where every month we're trying to provide an assessment of where we stand when it comes to the core pillars of the democratic order based on what's happened and what's taken place that month. Uh, for example, in this month's issue, it's the resurgence of the pandemic. That's one of the top line stories of the month, but also questions that have been raised about the integrity of the election and a peaceful transfer of power, uh, which obviously has impacts on democracy and, and uh, both here and how the way we're perceived overseas. Uh, so, so that's, I uh, just wanted to flag that as a good resource to, um, to talk more and to, to uh, look more further into some of the things we're talking about today. Uh, but in terms of your question, uh, I think it's important to talk, to tackle this uh, at two levels. Uh, is this concept of democratic engagement gaining traction at the popular level with, you know, with regard to the way people are thinking about it here in the US and around the world, and then at the policymaker and official government level. Uh, it's interesting that because even before the pandemic hit, we were seeing in the polling data quite a bit of interest, public interest in maintaining American, uh, American engagement in the world. Uh, so even though Trump was elected on an, on an agenda, kind of a populist agenda against globalization and against uh, or, or skeptical about the way the U.S. has been mired in some of these wars and conflicts uh, in the Middle East, the reality, and, in, and he also ran on an anti-trade agenda, the reality is that the polling shows even stronger support today for some of these notions than in the past. So on uh, alliances, for example, we're now seeing very, very strong polling uh, indicating U.S. support support for the U.S. staying in NATO um, and being committed to these alliances because they protect our security as much as they protect our allies. We're seeing even increased support for trade, for, for uh, free and open trade agreements, uh, just as a general matter. Now, obviously, the specifics matter, but but 
there is support for an, an economy that connects to the world rather than isolates us from the world. But there's also support for democracy promotion. I think most Americans see the United States as a, a champion of democracy and that we have always stood for certain values in this space and they like that image of the United States. It uh, doesn't mean we all agree on how to do that uh, and certainly using military force in the way that we did in Iraq is not uh, by any means uh, where the consensus is. Uh, but the idea of, of upholding certain values and having the United States act on those values is, is quite popular. So, so that's the basis for what I would say a lot of fertile ground to build on when it comes to public engagement and public support um, for the kind of uh, leadership role that we're talking about in this project. Um, and that brings us then to how, how do other how are we doing in terms of engagement with other officials? And like I said earlier, we're, we're seeing renewed interest in new platforms for engagement among the democratic community. Uh, the Brits, as I said, with their G7 presidency, uh, that's going to be a, an important opportunity to look at. Uh, we had already seen uh, other allies stepping up, especially as the US has taken a back seat on a lot of these issues to maintain support for a rules-based order by talking and engaging with each other um, more so than in the past. Um, this alliance for multilateralism that the Germans kicked off is an effort in that direction. Uh, Prime Minister Abe, before he stepped down in Japan, has talked about building a network of countries committed to the rules-based order in Asia. Um, and, and he and others have started the Quad, uh, the, 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 this kind of four power framework for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. It's Japan, Australia, India, and the United States um, as another way of bringing democratic uh, nations together to cooperate on uh, common, in, in that part of the world on common issues, particularly China as the subtext. So, um, so I think what we're starting to see is the recognition that we, we not only benefit from having stronger cooperation from democracies, but that we also don't need to be overly concerned about the optics uh, of what that cooperation looks like in, in, a, in a more public way. Before, I think there was, especially in Europe, a lot of consternation about, well, how will the Chinese react or how will the Russians react if they see some of these coalitions taking place with democracies. And I, I think the, the reality has set in that that these are, these are in our interest to do regardless of how they will look to the Chinese or the Russians. And in fact, that they're not going to, that even if these coalitions are taking place, it's not going to change anything about the way they interact. They're continuing to see the, the challenges the same way. And um, I don't think the, this polarization that a lot of people feared uh, when, you, when you start cooperating with democracies uh, is going to change. The polarization exists already. The Chinese and the Russians not, not always see eye to eye themselves, but they certainly have a very different view about uh, the, the global system. Uh, and they're going to pursue those goals regardless of whether we're talking to each other uh, or not. Um, we have a question in the chat, Nick. Would, should we take it? Um, or should we continue? Because I could, I could ask you questions all day. <laughs> well, why don't, Tatiana, why don't you go ahead and, and continue, and then we will start grouping together the uh, the comments. And 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 uh, Alex uh, Woodson will be moderating that from the Carnegie side. But just I know, hearing Ash's answer, uh, I expected Tatiana that you would have some follow up. So why don't we finish that uh, finish that uh, that line of questioning? Yeah. Um, so I, I really wanted to talk about this public idea of support for international institutions here. And I'm wondering if pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, you, you may have seen a difference. Um, and going back again to my question of the fact that so, there's been so much um, economic loss and um, upheaval 
uh, in, you know, I especially, my research focuses on millennial and Gen Z audiences um, and their priorities. Um, and some of the polling I've been doing, and granted it's smaller scale, but some of the feedback I've been getting is that this notion that they're not sure of America's place in the world, that perhaps they do view uh, the democratic ideals as positive and something that uh, are shared and more common than not. But, but there's this idea of, well, what can we do? What can we really do to, to make change on a global level when we can't even afford to pay rent this month? Um, and, and I think that we, we, you know, this polling pre and post pandemic, we should look at also because I do feel that there might be some slight ch changes in how much we feel and how fast we feel we can make this change happen, I, especially considering um, we might have a second Trump administration and that might look very different. Um, have you built in these considerations into your kind of long term planning project planning. Yeah. Uh you're raising a very, very relevant point, uh, which is not only how has the pandemic affected uh, perceptions of American leadership, but also how have these kind of simultaneous crises, racial injustice and uh, George Floyd killing, um, the, the kind of astonishing remarks uh, that we've seen from the president when it comes to whether he's going to commit to a peaceful transfer of power, just basics of the way in which American, the United States has been seen as a leader, that's affecting public opinion here at home, uh, and especially among younger people. I think we're seeing the same dynamic where younger people are much less confident that the United States has the moral authority to lead uh, the, way, the way the US has for so many decades previously. Um, there are a lot of question marks about uh, you know, how can we be in a position where we're trying to tell or, or uh, explain, you know, try, trying to advocate for certain ways that uh, authoritarians should govern um, when, when we're not doing such a great job at it here at home? It's this question of modeling good behavior and serving as an example. Um, and that's, that, that I think it's critical. It's, it's really, we're just at the beginnings of, you know, now I think seeing how that will impact um, um, you know, the, the way forward, in some ways it, it, it comes, it'll come down to what happens in the election uh, next month. But it's certainly raising a lot of question marks about how can America lead um, if, it's, if it's not able to provide a kind of example for leadership here at home. Uh, connecting the foundations of democracy or, 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 or connecting the foundation of those values at home with how we lead abroad um, is something that's gotten a lot more attention lately as a result of what we're seeing take place over the past six months. Uh, and, and that's really, it is, it's a critical conversation to have. Uh, I guess my own view is that there is always going to be, this isn't the first time we faced tensions like this. Um, you know, we've, we've had the, the riots of the 1960s. We've had a lot of times in, in our own history where um, it was, the, clear that the U.S. wasn't living up to the kind of values and aspirations that it was expecting from, from countries abroad. Um, and we have to do a better job here at home of, of getting our house in order, uh, of getting the leadership on the, these issues headed in the right direction. But if the, that's also a time-consuming process. It's not going to happen overnight. And I don't think we can sequence them. It's not like we have to get everything perfect here at home before we now have a voice to advocate for these kinds of issues abroad, they're going to have to happen simultaneously. Um, they're related, but they're also complementary. And uh, what it'll take is is real moral leadership from the you know from the top. Um, and so the the rhetoric that comes out of our national leaders, starting with the president, matters a great deal, even if the actions aren't yet matched on the ground. So. If you have a leader who is taking these concerns seriously and making it clear that the aspiration is to ensure that we're living up to our values at home, that will go a long way to giving us credibility to then advocate for those same kind of uh, values and norms overseas. I absolutely agree with you that these local levels like the Black Lives Matter protests 
aren't just our uh, protests, right? We saw them exploding in countries all around the world. Um, you know, I was looking at a, a Black Lives Matter protest map globally, and there was something over 4,000 protests around the world linked to this. So that we're finding that, I guess, in, in how does that affect sort of what you're talking about um, with, uh, with national leaders, that internal issues, domestic issues are really becoming part of foreign policy. Um, you yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, I think, you know, it, what it goes to show, which strikes me, which struck me at the time was how much people around the world are paying attention to what's happening here at home, here in the United States. Um, and, and why is that? I mean, partly it's just the ubiquity of the media, which, um, you know, it tends to give a lot of attention um, to, to things that are happening over here in the U.S., but partly it's driven by the, the notion that what happens in the United States matters because the U.S. has always been seen as a bedrock for standing for certain kinds of ideals, uh, a, a certain kind of uh, system of governance that uh, is not perfect by any means, uh, but is, is one that, that, um, that could impact the way their own government and their own people uh, see these issues. Um, people, you know, especially in some of our allies, um, you know, I think they, they want to see, uh, they, 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 they feel connected with the kinds of issues and concerns um, that are taking place here uh, and, and that are affecting some of their own lives overseas. It's no longer just national, you know, it's not contained within national boundaries. Black Lives Matter is a great example of that. Uh, we saw the same thing with the National Women's March that took place um, you know, a few days after the Trump election or inauguration, where all around the world, there were people standing up and taking to the streets because you know, it was a way of expressing solidarity. It was a way of expressing concerns for some of the same issues. Um, and, and I think that feeds right into what we're trying to capitalize on here in this project, which is all around the world, there is this yearning for the same kind of uh, same set of values, norms, and principles around which to organize and engage our own societies and to engage with each other. So it's really incumbent up upon our leaders to see the world and to seek the connections uh, and harness those so that we're, we're able to pull in the same direction and, and uh, you know, leverage our own capabilities to address these challenges. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the Carnegie Council's uh, Alex Woodson if he wouldn't mind uh, going ahead. I think we have questions coming in uh, and comments uh, for Ash. So why don't we introduce uh, uh, those audience uh, uh, contributions into our discussion here. Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, first question is from George F. Paik. Uh, question is G7 plus South Korea and Australia makes nine. The choice of number 10 could suggest very different directions. As you mentioned, India, but you can see different impl implications of say Brazil or Spain or Nigeria and complications. How well has America defined the values on which we want to engage? After democracy, what should be America's next principle for this? It's a great question. Um, starting with the, the idea of who, who, who makes up the D10. Uh, th that's always, uh, a challenge, it's a conundrum as to, first of all, is 10 the right number? It's an arbitrary choice. Uh, it sounds good. Um, it's, you know, people like round numbers like that. Um, and, and I'm often reminded that the Big Ten Football League used to have 10, and now I believe has 14 uh, teams in it. So it's still called the Big Ten. So, um, so 10 doesn't necessarily mean 10, I guess is the first way to start off. Um, at the moment, uh, the, the D10 meetings that we convene include the G7 plus Australia, Korea, and then the European Union has, has the 10th seat, so to speak. So, so it becomes 10 you know, entities or powers that get together on a regular basis. This is a, a kind of um, a forum that meets to discuss strategy every now and then. Uh, but if it's uh, raised up to the leaders level, uh, there will be discussion about whether or not there should be a, an additional uh, set of nations that should be, you know, invited to join the discussion. And India has already been mentioned uh, as probably the next major democracy to, um, to be included in a D10 format. Um, 
in part because uh, India is facing a lot of the same challenges in the Indo-Pacific region uh, when it comes to concerns about China. Uh, so there, there are very good reasons to include countries beyond the nine that are already uh, involved along with the EU. But there are also concerns that if you expand too fast and you start bringing in others, uh, you, you may end up hindering the, the very goal that we're trying to achieve, which is to say it becomes harder to get consensus when you have countries that are coming from say traditions of non-alignment coming from countries where they're maybe reticent to speak out publicly uh, or, or sign on to, let's say, statements of concern uh, that could criticize, be critical of, of countries like Russia or China. Um, often, oftentimes, they, they want to stay away from kind of direct mention of some of these challenges because they share borders or they feel more obligated to kind of play it safe. Uh, at least publicly. So that's a concern uh, when it comes to sh sanctions, let's say on you know, sanctions that uh, much of the world, uh, the democratic world have imposed on Russia for its invasion of Crimea. Uh, the G7 has been a great instrument to keep, uh, to keep the sanctions issue on the table. And uh, you know, what would that be the case if you start bringing in countries that maybe aren't prepared to support those kinds of efforts? Um, so I think it's worth careful consideration about where we draw the line and what kind of criteria we want to impose. Um, or maybe it's not so much criteria, but it's expectations um, of what it means if you're going to be signing on to a club of democracies like the D10. Uh, there has to be some baseline understanding and expectation of uh, what we are trying to achieve, what the goals are, and, and what we're prepared to do. Um, and that goes for all of the powers. I mean, today, the US, it's not so clear where we stand on a lot of these uh, concerns ourselves. So, um, you know, that, that, uh, that's, I think, important if we're going to step up and elevate the G7 to a D10. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. The, 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 uh, the, the, the question of the, G, the D10 is, it hinges on a lot of different other topics that we could get into, but let's maybe uh, take those as we get into other questions. Another question from the chat, that's okay. Uh, this is a yes, yes. good segue from the end of your last answer. This is from J.D. Estrell. The consensus among political scholars in America is that democracy is a goal yet to be obtained. Is the United States still the global leader in the idea and practice of democracy, especially given the current administration? Are there any other countries or a particular country that are doing it better than the United States? Well, we talked about this a little bit. I mean, we, we are certainly facing here at home many challenges to the aspiration of democracy and justice um, that, uh, that many, many people are still striving for the US to achieve. Um, so, you know, it, it, I guess part of it is it becomes a matter of putting it in context and it's, it's, uh, it's a bit, you know, seeing, seeing it in relative to others. Um, there are, we tend to rely on a very good you know, political science data research that's conducted by entities like Freedom House um, or The Economist, uh, which do very good surveys using different criteria to measure where we stand, where countries stand when it comes to democratic norms. Uh, you know, the protection of civil liberties, um, political rights, freedom of the press, uh, all those things that constitute what a democracy is, you know, do people have the right to vote? Do they have the right to participate in a free and fair election? Uh, are they able to freely associate and speak their minds and practice their religions? Um, you know, the many elements and factors that go into what a democracy is. Um, freedom from discrimination, certainly one of them, and, and equal protection under the law. So for, for uh, I think it's pretty clear that we can say two things about that. The, the US has a ways to go if it wants to achieve those standards, especially when it comes to equal protection and um, uh, justice in many areas. Um, we have a ways to go when it comes to corruption of, of public officials. And we've seen that exposed uh, more so in the last few years, uh, maybe than, than previously. Uh, we have a ways to go in terms of 
political participation in our democracy. But having said all that, uh, Freedom House still ranks the US very highly when it comes to democracy uh, criteria. And that's because when you look at what's happening elsewhere in many autocratic countries around the world, um, you know, there's no comparison uh, where, where in China, the, the Chinese government is putting Uyghurs in prison camps and forced labor and committing sort of atrocities that we can't imagine. Uh, it's happening, it's happening today, it's happening right now, and it's happening by a government uh, that is otherwise trying to portray itself as a responsible global actor. Um, when you see the Russian government simply denying any opportunity, meaningful opportunity for people to, to you know, run for public office to challenge the dominant you know, dictatorship of Vladimir Putin, you know, poisoning uh, opposition figures to deter them uh, from acting out and speaking out, I mean, this is real. This is this is this is happening, uh, in, in and and then it's not just autocratic countries uh, where that that kind of blatant um, anti-democratic act activity is taking place. Many other countries are struggling with how to balance, um, you know, liberal open societies with other factors like concerns about terrorism, and and we're seeing in India, for instance, greater steps being taken to limit reporting uh, about activities in Kashmir that are you know, inconsistent with, uh, with some of the liberal norms that we would want to see in a democracy. Um, and, and so uh, in places like Hungary uh, and in Turkey, I mean, we're seeing that even more uh, stridently, leaders taking the country in a different direction. So by all, I think that's all to say basically that it's, it's relative and that there have to be some criteria by which we, we can judge where we stand. Um, and, and so it doesn't minimize what's happening here at home, but puts it in some perspective. For the United States to lead, I very strongly believe, however, that we do have to sh be engaged in commitments to making, making the model of democratic practice work better here at home um, and, and making sure that our leaders take that seriously and, and reflect on that uh, if we're going to be able to maintain credibility overseas, yeah. There's just to interject, uh, not take away from the uh, from the audience questions, but two things you've just said that have triggered uh, thoughts in my mind. The first is whether or not, because of the pandemic, because of the 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 uh, the issues with the Uyghurs, the detention, the the essential, you know, attempting to strip them of their nationality and of their identity, the Hong Kong protests, if that's leading people in. The, in the in the democratic world to to question the trade dependencies with China and even perhaps a willingness to pay some higher costs, right? That uh, perhaps I sh we should pay more of a premium uh, to buy goods and services from other democracies because at least we know that they weren't made in a in a slave labor camp. You means I have to pay twenty percent more uh, than others, uh, and so that you know maybe the and I think there are some questions touching on that, and then the other I think that you've raised here, and, and you mentioned the the community of democracies, which is that you know starting with you know essentially the consol a consolidated group of democracies, starting small, not allowing democracy to be in essence self-identifying, because I think yeah. that was one of the, the the flaws of the community of democracies was that it, it gave a much wider range for countries to self-identify. Well, we're democratic, or we, you know, we're democratizing, uh, but then we're now we're having slide back, or we're moving away. And so again, maybe going back to George's point too about you know the D10, you know, maybe being a little vague about the 10 is actually a, a benefit, a feature rather than a bug. But uh, Alex, I know we have more que questions are coming in fast and furious, so uh, let me turn it back over to to you. Thanks, Nick. So we have two more questions that we should get to. And if people want to keep sending more, maybe we can do a couple of quick ones. But um, just to continue on with China, this is from Vino Wolfkuhl. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, what is the probability and or likelihood of severing or lessening economic relations with China, being that they back trillions of dollars over loans, or at a minimum, establishing, establishing some economic accountability for COVID, being that they are the source? Yeah, we haven't talked a lot about China, um, and it's it's 
one of the, if not the most significant, you know, political, geopolitical challenge that we face or, and, uh, and are going to be facing over the next foreseeable future, several years. Part of the notion of having uh, an, an entity like the D10 is to try to bring some collective weight to how to deal with the China challenge. Uh, it's certainly not the only reason, but uh, having democracies aligned on a common approach to China is, is critically important because China benefits by kind of dividing the democratic world and you know, looking for weak points in the way it wants to engage um, and, and, and expand its own influence. And one of the big issues that we will have to contend with is how do we deal with China as an economic power, given that so many of our economies are interlinked with China. It's, it's the biggest, it's the, you know, China is the number one trading partners partner for so many countries, number one or number two for almost every you know, country worldwide. And it really is a, a challenge to deal with a government that is otherwise taking you know, some horrific measures as we've talked about with the Uyghurs and cracking down in Hong Kong just openly um, that is, is contrary to democratic values. Um, so I guess my, my own view on that, and I kind of agree with the way the direction Nick was going on this is that there is a greater willingness to, to uh, impose measures that could end up hurting, hurting um, or, or impacting finance, you know, economic cost uh, in the short term because we're seeing a longer term gain. And I, I think that that's, um, that's reflected in um, the, a lot of the, the comments and outcry that we're seeing for what's happening with, uh, with Xinjiang, uh, with the Uyghurs. We've seen it in the past where, you know, if, if soccer balls were made with child labor uh, from Bangladesh or wherever, people are willing to say, no, that's not right. We're gonna cut off that kind of trade practice and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to buy those goods even if they were cheaper, uh, even if they were available for cheaper. The same thing can apply here. Uh, I think if people knew that these goods were being made in forced labor camps um, and if they knew that there was a way to punish the Chinese or pressure the Chinese to stop those practices, there would be a willingness to consider that kind of uh, increased, you know, potentially uh, short-term economic cost. Uh, and, but very quickly, I think the idea really structurally is to make sure we've got alternative sources so that we're not entirely dependent on the Chinese and that sanctions against China wouldn't be that harmful to our own economies. The Chinese have done very well. What they've done well is make it so that it becomes hard for any um, you know, for, for any country to take action against it uh, and, and, and therefore it has a free hand. It's kind of this idea of mutual economic uh, destruction, uh, mutual, mutually assured economic destruction. Um, so I, I do think that there has to be accountability for China uh, for what it's, what it's doing uh, in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, uh, for the kind of uh, kind of negligent efforts in controlling the coronavirus early on hiding it before it could be dealt with um, from a health point of view. Um, but how we do that is not something we should do unilaterally. It has to be done in partnership and as part of a coalition of democracies because it's likely to have much more influence and, and effectiveness if it's the democratic world joined by others, uh, a broader group uh, that, are, that are imposing those, those, pe those penalties. And um, and it's likely to have less of an of a biting impact on any one particular country. If, if I could jump in though, um, I, I think in some of your writing, I did see that there is space to engage autocratic powers like Russia and China. And mm -hmm. I'm particularly thinking of climate change as an issue and I, uh, because that tends to be the issue that millennials and Gen Z rate as their top number one international priority is this kind of move forward on doing more um, to counter uh, the detrimental environmental impacts of manufacturing processes, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, is this an area that we can actually engage a China and a Russia, any other part person or part of, uh, that is not part of this democratic coalition? I mean, what are the avenues? How do we do that? Um, how do you foresee that in your work? Yeah, well, engagement of uh, non-democracies 
is a very important piece of the overall puzzle. Uh, we can't simply uh, try to create these isolated networks of democracies and say, you know, either you're in or you're out, and we're not gonna talk to anybody else. Uh, quite the contrary. I think part of the benefit of having a coalition of democracies is it allows us to talk about a strategy for how to engage and, and do that more effectively. We have to engage with, with autocratic powers or all powers around the world, uh, simply because whether we like it or not, they have a tremendous influence uh, on the international system on trade and economics, as we've talked about with the Chinese. So there has, there has to be, and plus they, many of these are nuclear armed powers that could create a lot of havoc. I mean, they could do a lot of damage if uh, suddenly they're feeling like they're you know, completely in a Cold War kind of confrontation. So we don't want to encourage that kind of dynamic. Uh, there has to be a kind of a balance between working together to advance common interests uh, among democracies, but then finding avenues to stay connected and to try to find areas where there is common concern uh, and uh, an interest in moving together. Climate change is a great example. Um, we're already seeing the Chinese you know, make positive rhetorical steps towards meeting uh, some of the climate goals um, that, uh, that are spelled out in the Paris Agreement and others. Uh, so I think encouraging that dialogue will be really important as we move forward, um, having a, a platform where we can have those conversations with non-democracies is, is just as important as the ones with democracies. And that's why I mentioned early on that I think the D10 is, is great as a starting point for democratic coordination, but the G20, which exists already as the kind of larger table uh, with a bigger group of countries, is important to maintain and, and prioritize. Uh, it's a great forum. It's a great venue for talking about some of these big challenges like climate, uh, like nuclear nonproliferation. Um, and, and I think it's really important to have those dialogues, whether it's in a multilateral or a bilateral setting. Uh, I also, I mean, we have to be realistic about what can be achieved because sometimes the Chinese may give lip service to making steps in, the positive, in a positive direction or others, uh, when in reality, they, they just really you know, want to kind of, it's, it's about building a brand and building an image more about than, than it is about action. Uh, but still, I think it's important to have the dialogue channels open uh, while being realistic about what it is we can really achieve um, and, and in the hopes that we can make progress on some of these other challenges. Well, I think that uh, you were addressing, I think, some of the other questions that were being uh, being posted, uh, but I think what you've what you've laid out for us here is, is is very intriguing because we, you know, to the extent that we are at a nexus point in world affairs, moving into the mid twenty first century, what you've been discussing here, I think, is laying the basis for a new type of narrative that could, you know, fill the gaps for Americans and for others about engagement in the world. Uh, in this case greater cooperation and coordination among democracies, leading to things like health security, technology security, even economic security, but also, uh, as Tatiana has pointed out here as well, moving and transitioning towards uh, what is emerging as a climate change or narrative about foreign policy, about you know, mitigating, solving, mitigating, adapting to uh, the climactic shifts that we're seeing and how this ties back to things like energy, ties back to technology, ties back to day-to-day -day issues, whether or not you're dealing with wildfires, flooding, uh, unemployment, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, is there any, uh, any last thoughts, uh, either Tatsana, any final comment from you, and then we'll let Ash uh, have the final word uh, for this uh, webinar. Well, I think that our discussion today was very important in showcasing uh, why we need to do some more homework uh, as a society on, on reflecting on what, who, and who we are in the world. Um, I think this is a very important um, to, to continue this discussion uh, going forward. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure to have a chance to have this conversation. There's so many, brings up so many issues that we didn't get to. Uh, there's so much to talk about in terms of specific actions and trade-offs uh, that we, you know, we didn't really spend as much time on as we should. 
there are trade-offs involved. Uh, there are complicated questions about, you know, if you push in one direction, does it then create tensions in another direction? And how do you reconcile those? Uh, so a lot more to say on this, but the, I think the general direction of where we're headed uh, looks more and more realistic today than it has in the past. A lot of interest in building a democratic community, consolidating support for uh, entities like the D10 and democratic cooperation. Uh, and so I'm uh, uh, happy to be part of a conversation, uh, hopefully the beginning of a conversation that will continue uh, as we go forward. Well, we certainly will welcome you back to uh, explore these in future webinars, uh, future uh, episodes of The Doorstep. And also, again, to remind the audience, uh, we have linked to the, uh, to the project. Uh, I don't know if the Declaration of Principles is, is still there, uh, but people can look at that. I don't know if you still are, you know, people yeah. can decide to the extent that they want to affiliate with those principles as well. Uh, but definitely, uh, take from this, not just uh, the hour that we've spent, uh, but uh, this is uh, you know, going to the Democratic Order Initiative site that we've posted will enable you to uh, continue your engagement uh, uh, with those issues. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for being with us today. Uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, and speaking with you virtually through our webinars, through the doorstep, through other uh, platforms here at the Carnegie Council. Uh, and until our next event, uh, I bid everyone having a wonderful day and take care. Bye. Thank you.